Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Hytro Performance Podcast, where we talk about all things performance and BFR. Today, we're talking to Casey Tuhill, a defensive end at Buffalo Bills, about his BFR use and how he's been using Hytro and some of the exciting stuff going on this season in the NFL. So first of all, Casey, thanks so much for your time. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to get into the, the details here. It's, um, it would be remiss of us not to start with this, but not only are you an exceptionally busy you know, superstar <laughs> athlete, you've just got married <laughs> and you're yes. back straight away. How is that? Yeah, it's great. You know, um, really exciting. Was able to do it uh, in the period between our off-season training and uh, when we started camp. So had a perfect, you know, month, uh, able to do that. It was incredible. And then, you know, was came back to having no free time and uh, a very rigorous schedule. So it was good to get that and, and, and have that great experience, you know, carry me into the, the hardest part of my year. <laughs> From the Caribbean to Buffalo. So, you know, same, same. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. A little different. How, um, I guess, how do you get into that mindset going from, uh, you know, getting married is not relaxing at all, but what is a really, <laughs> really important time uh, in an athlete, the preseason? What what goes through your head? How do you get yourself psyched up for that? Yeah, great question. I mean, it's, I've had so many training camps, you know, ever since, you know, my first year of college football, that's really when you have like the intense training camps all the way through, you know, now my fifth year in the NFL. And it's always kind of the same. You get a little break beforehand to kind of, you know, get away, uh, spend some time with family, which is always nice in my case, you know, really spend time with family, get married, uh, add to my family. So that's that's always nice. But then it really comes down to, you know, a week before, a few days before, during that off time, just really, you know, focusing on your goals and just just getting excited for the start of another season. And and it's always challenging to go from, you know, free time to no free time and and really, you know, a difficult task ahead. But, uh, you know, you, there's there's nothing ever great that just comes around, uh, comes from having just off time. Right. So to to be great, to accomplish what I want to accomplish, you really have to put in the work. So training camps are start of that. And I always look forward to that. So for those people, I mean, American football is growing at an exponential rate in, in sure. Europe. Um, you see that with the work the NFL is doing. Everyone's really, really excited about, you know, flag getting into LA 28. For those over here in Europe and the UK who may not have heard of you, can you give me like a brief journey from you as like, like a high school athlete to now, yeah, your fifth year in the league? Sure. Yeah. So I've, I mean, I've played football as long as I can remember. Um, always wanted to play division one football. That was the goal. I didn't even really think about playing the, in the NFL when I was young, yeah. it was a dream, but it wasn't the main focus, right? I really wanted to, when I started playing football, go to a good division one program. And obviously in the States, it's a little bit different because college football here is such, such a big deal and, and such a big achievement. So that started to become a possibility towards towards the end of my time in high school. And I was able to commit to Stanford, which is a really excellent academic institution here in the US. Um, so got there, you know, was playing football again, not sure if I was going to play in the NFL, but just was enjoying the experience, really enjoyed playing collegiate football there, learned a lot. And then as my time went on, it looked like that possibility of playing professionally was was more and more realistic. And I, I was getting better and I, I was growing and everything, everything was kind of on track there. And so I got drafted uh, first by the Eagles, played there a little bit, but then was claimed by the Commanders in my first year, played for the Commanders for four years, great experience. And then this offseason, uh, I joined the Buffalo Bills, which is an excellent organization, you know, uh, long track record of of winning and 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 being um very successful so that's been exciting and um we have week one you know coming up this sunday so so gearing up for that and it's been a it's been a very long but eventful journey for me thus far yeah i bet i mean i'm we're we're uh we're american football fans nfl fans over here and i love the bills i'm a i'm a sucker for a coaching quote and like a legacy and like the amount of quotable lines you get from the Bills team about like the oh, Bills yeah. team, when it's too hard for them, it's just right for us type thing. Like I love that. And that speaks, I think, a little bit to, you know, the athlete mindset here, the things we like about you as an athlete. So um, you said that it's been like football as long as you can remember and you had, you were at, you know, a great school. Can you, without getting yourself in trouble, give us a bit of a, uh, an idea of the difference between the college game and the pro game i mean there's some very oh, obvious differences sure. but like are we talking college is uh all skill and pro is no 
bigger, bigger, harder, stronger? Like what's the biggest difference between those two games? Great question. I honestly think the, um, the comparison I can make and I think it's similar is when you go from high school football to college football, there's a big step up in terms of, you know, just the seriousness overall, the size and the strength and the speed of the guys you play with in your competition and just, you know, your schedule and just how much time you need to dedicate to recovery, um, you know, watching extra film um, and just improving. It's just a big step up. And I feel like there is a similar step up from the collegiate game to the professional game in terms of, again, the, the talent of who you're going against and you're playing with, right? The size, the speed, everything like that. And then also being a pro, knowing how to take care of your body, knowing how you need to study film. It's kind of all the same in terms of it's all like, you know, a gradual kind of step up. So yeah, very similar. I mean, there's a lot of similarities now, especially with, you know, the the new uh, landscape with NIL and stuff. So there is compensation and, you know, the big TV deals. So collegiate and, and pro football are looking more and more and more and more similar every day. But still, I think the talent level is obviously greater. You know, the best player you might play all year in college, that's basically every person in the NFL, right? They're always the best. So it's, so it's, it's a big step up, but as you get accustomed to it, more comfortable, it, it, it's, it starts to be similar, but yeah, definitely, definitely a change from the, the collegiate to professional levels. And um, can you, for again, maybe the European audience and sure. for uh, the other sports in the audience that we end up speaking to a lot, can you give us a little bit of insight around the defensive end? What are the uh, sure. athletic attributes that set you up well you know what's your role in the game uh, how, how does your how does your performance play out specifically because of that role you play totally and it, that's a great question because I think the position of defensive end has changed a lot from the genesis of football to now because now football is about the quarterbacks and throwing the ball and you know touchdowns and, and making big plays it's different and the, and the game's evolving so defensive end has become the position of chasing after the quarterback and rushing the quarterback and trying to get sacks and affecting the game. So it's become a very important position. So, you know, I think of defensive end, you want someone that has a lot of different athletic attributes and skills. You're kind of well-rounded, if I may. You know, you're big, like you're one of the bigger players, but you also have to be strong, but you also have to be explosive and fast, right? You almost have to take a little bit of every position and meld it, mold it into this um, kind of prototypical player that really can affect the game. So I think the positions become even more important over the years and, and I've loved playing it. I mean, I played a similar position since high school and I feel like the importance of the position has only grown since I've started playing football. Yeah. I think you, and you spoke to about um, the maybe growing level in collegiate sport professionalism for those guys. It, it's even more important then that those players coming through can have all of the attribute attributes. You know, it's going to be very hard, I imagine, outside of QB or the, or the or the big offensive lineman to specialize early on. It's it's healthy as an athlete to keep all those attributes. Absolutely, um, yeah. Then last year, you you know, career high five sacks at the end of the year. Like, do you set new goals each season for yourself? Um, do you try to cover a bit of everything, or do you have some clear goals you set yourself at the start of each campaign? Yeah, great question. I I mean, I set goals for myself constantly, you know, different training periods have different goals, whether it's, you know, when we're not playing football in the off season, what I want to work on, whether it's, you know, off season football, when you're out with the team, whether it's training camp, and now the season's coming. So I mean, I'm going to set my new goals this week. But yeah, last year, I had a goal of getting five sacks. That was one of my main goals. And I achieved that. So this year, I mean, now it's the the next step up. And I, I try not to always focus on the outcome goals because I think that takes away from the enjoyment of the process. And then you really start chasing objective things and football can be subjective, right? So it's hard to, to just set yourself up statistically with goals, but yeah, I will all create some new goals this week. I'm sure uh, after having five, I'd like to have more sacks this next season. But again, I think really the focus is what are, you know, the parts of the process that I want to improve. And I, I think I've already started to do that and had some goals around that. So I'll really hone in on those now that the season started and, and make some changes based on, you know, my season last year and this season and, and, and it's always changing and evolving. I'll say. I, um I like personally, and, and as a brand, I think falling in love with the process is something we can uh, uh, definitely agree on. And it, it, I hear that from you when we talk and absolutely. Uh, 
I think that's really important for longevity. Like you said, if you're only going to measure success uh -huh. by that end goal, if you miss it, is it a failure? Not at all, right? Because the, the, you're stronger in the process. Is that something, uh, oh, sorry. So my question actually is more like, talk to me more about that, how you are as personally, do, is that something you think about? But then also, do you see that in the current team setup? Is that something that you hear from coaches as well? Or is that something that you bring yourself? Yeah, I mean, that's been echoed in, in so many of our meetings, I think are, our head coach, Sean McDermott, does an excellent job of having like a holistic mindset about things, right? Because football is too hard and too long if you just, and the season's too long, right? If you just chase, you know, wins or stats, and then it's just kind of like a hollow experience, right? Like the best part of a team game is winning with your team and, and helping each other and like knowing that you have each other's backs. I mean, if you're solely chasing stats, like, you're really not going to have that good of a time. And then it also just doesn't feel great when you achieve that. I mean, I even remember that with wanting, you know, five sacks. I was like, okay, great. I got this. Now I want more, you know? So it's, it's more about, I think for me, it's the process of improvement and being able to know that I'm better than when I started. And that was because of my diligent hard work. That feels the best to me. And that's what I do enjoy, enjoy the most. Do you, you think you were always destined to be a team sport athlete then? Great question. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I was just always destined to do a sport. I mean, I think just, again, kind of reiterating what we were talking about with the process and falling in love with improving. That's my main focus. And that's what I love about sport, right? It's just, you know, acknowledging and understanding your weaknesses and working on them in a, um, like, objective manner. It's just, there's nothing better to me than that. I mean, I think the best part of sport and why we do sport is to learn about life and to help set ourselves up for when we're done with sport and so that's really what I try to do and and falling in love with with doing intentional hard work is really where I'm at and I think that carries me through through life and that's really just like a major um character trait of mine I love that, I really like that. and I think it's that's just like because hard work is just so you know, I feel like we have all these kind of cliches, especially in sport or like in the startup world, you hear all these cliches and you, you hear them so much that you're like, I don't care about that. Right. Like you hear, you're like, whatever. Oh, work hard. Great. Right. Yeah, of course. Like, but those things are still important and that's why they're repeated and they're cliches because there is some value there, but I feel like you need to almost like repackage it because um, it is a cliche. So you need to like repackage it for how it works for you. And yeah. that's intense hard work for me. If you're not going to be, you know, early to training, work hard and give 100%, you, you know, you're never going to make it. What so are you doing? Thing, yeah. isn't it? An elite athlete that you hang your hat on because everybody should be doing that. So it's no, totally. intentional hard work, you know, you know uh, practice with intent, right? And exactly. And just working more than the other guy isn't impressive to me because anyone can do that. You can, you know, work more hours than someone and just stay in your office. But it's like, what are you accomplishing? Are you meeting your goals? Are you addressing things that you need to improve? Like, if you're not like, if you don't have a clear and concise plan for your work, like you're not actually accomplishing anything. For sure. So then this like leads me nicely on to, uh, we, we see a ton of stories coming from the preseason or um, out of season training of various sports and athletes and teams. I can only imagine how grueling NFL preseason is. <laughs> yeah. You've just wrapped up and, and in some starter camps as well. Like, talk to me about it. What was from, you know, day one of preseason to now, what, what does that look like? What was the experience like? Yeah, honestly, it's just um, the schedule is just probably the most challenging portion. You need to be on for most of the day, you know, probably almost 12 hours, right? You constantly have meetings walkthroughs practice i mean practice is probably the best part of it right it's it's only probably like two hours and it's always enjoyable to improve and compete but the the constant meetings walkthroughs meals just not having any time to yourself it, it is challenging but um i i do think the nfl has done at least the teams i've been with they've done a much better job of you know giving you more off time helping you like recover like i honestly think college was way 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 more challenging in terms of that and the nfl it's more challenging in terms of the stakes but they do a much better job of like keeping you healthy not overworking you so i i mean i really enjoyed my my camp experience this year i really enjoyed being with this this team for camp and um yeah now just focused on the season 
how much of um, preseason is about learning the game, style of game, playing with each mm-hmm. other versus moving forward, your performance markers, making you bigger, faster, stronger, you know, hold, holding off injury. What's the mix between like the game and physical for you at preseason? Or, I, change by position and player, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, and I think this is part of being a pro. I mean, preseason is all about football. It's about learning the scheme. It's about performing the scheme. It's about practice and meetings, right? That's what it is. Because the off season is more about like any physical changes you want to make. So you really don't have a lot of time to focus on your recovery, your strength and conditioning, um, even your nutrition. But part of being a pro is still incorporating that into your routine. Because that's kind of where no one holds your hand. The team doesn't do as much of that stuff for you. But you have to take it upon yourself to do it. Because that's still crucial it's just not the focus that's really interesting so then um wow so you you would have like team training and recovery but then also again i guess what we're talking about right intentional hard work you have not just working more than the other guy intentionally you actually then take your own recovery and performance into your hands and okay so for you then like recovery is the thing that i guess ties all athletes together what does recovery look like for you on a, on a day-to-day basis? What are you adding into the mix? I know, you know we talk mm-hmm. about BFR in a second, but what else is there? What else do you look at? I mean, I think I try to, I've tried everything recovery wise. I'm, I'm kind of like a guinea pig in that sort. So I'm always interested and curious in different recovery methods. But I mean, the, the foundational piece for me is, you know, the science of it, the studies, the experts, you know, who I trust um, referring uh, referring me to it or just researching it. Uh, I mean, all, the foundational piece is the science and it actually working right. Cause I think in recovery and optimization, there's a lot of gimmicky things and things that are interesting to the, you know, average consumer, but um, you can't get too caught up in that. Cause a lot of times they're expensive too. And it's just, uh, so I've tried a lot of different things, but for me, I mean, the most basic thing is sleep, right? So making sure I'm sleeping well, trying to get nine hours, um, you know, sleeping in like a dark room and a cold room, stuff like that, trying to enhance my sleep, you know, supplements for sleep, stuff like stuff like that. That's number one. Nutrition, hydration, always super important. These are probably the most scientifically backed things you can do. And then it kind of comes into the modalities. I mean, I, you know, I think using heat, uh, massage, like there, there's all these other things. And then I think honestly, um, I think the best modality is BFR in terms of the research, um, how I feel afterwards, because that's a portion too. I mean, I think the placebo effect is real for a lot of people. And if something feels great for you and you feel great doing it, like some people feel great from doing ice or cryo, great. Like keep that in your routine. But for me, I'm a little too skeptical. So there used to, there has to be like a scientific portion to it as well. That's really interesting. We, um, we see, both sides of that coin and we uh, and there's an, always this internal struggle here on where to put our efforts as as a as a, as a leader in, in bfr industry um we know that there is incredible work to be done in uh lab-based and field-based research with objective data and especially with female athletes because there's so little in there yeah uh, to, uh i guess validate the performance claims anecdotal views of bfr there is also an undeniable feel good, play good factor in sport, right? Yeah. Uh, and then for you as an athlete, and we, you know, we ask coaches this a lot, but then for you as an athlete, is there one that you prioritize more, the, the objective or the, the subjective response? And, and do you see that reflected in your teammates, in your sport? Where, where's it going there on the value of recovery? Great question. I really think it's a balance. I mean, I try to make sure I'm doing all of the like scientifically objective recovery, just part of my routine. I just always try to incorporate that. Like you might not, I don't know, you might not feel great getting a little extra sleep or trying to, to make that a better habit, but I know that pays off or, or nutrition wise. But um, then there's also just a balance, you know, some days you wake up really sore and you're like, I just want to sit in the hot or the cold. And, and that's good too. Right. Like, All of this stuff has its place. And I think it's really on the individual athlete to find what helps them perform best. And uh, you spoke about doing some recovery and training uh, in the team setting, some at home. How is that different? Like at the the team, I'm assuming, you know, big stadium, you've got every modality you could imagine. Do you try and replicate that at home? Do you pick the bits that you like the most? What does it look like? You should talk to my wife because she thinks I have far too many modalities and tools at home. 
But um, honestly, I think when you go into the team setting, they have way more resources. So I think you get a bulk of your recovery done there. The stuff I try to do at home is more the extra work type stuff. Like, hey, I want to be doing more than the next guy. I'm relaxing. This is a very, you know, easy, um, like low effort to just put these BFR shorts on and relax, you know, Norma Tech, whatever it is. Um, that's kind of the low effort stuff, but also, you know, me being intentional with, hey, I'm just sitting around or I have this free time. I might as well you know, try to help myself or relax. And I think a lot of that stuff is relaxing. So I'm always just trying to do a little extra, but I do definitely get a bulk of my recovery in at the facility with the best resources. So you spoke about um, the importance of some objective research and data behind it for you to maybe try sure. something new. Um, and, and it's good. Like there is a lot of good journalism around bad modalities. So it, it, we, we are with you as well, very much research backed. But um, as an athlete and, and as, a, as a pro athlete, where it's your career to look after yourself, what was it that made you feel comfortable to, to try BFR and, and then, you know, have you kind of keep using it uh, in and out of the club like that? Yeah, great question. So I think I tried it first in college and I believe it was one of the more um, traditional like uh delphi units uh you know something we had like one and it was really expensive and it was interesting to me but the, but the application was really limited i wasn't able to do it much so i was like oh this is cool but whatever right and then i i'd used it a little bit since then and there's always been times but it was always just really cumbersome and i i just never felt like i could get a ton out of it because you know not a lot of machines and just so much limitation what you could do and honestly like sometimes that just just didn't feel great with how much pressure there was and 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 that was maybe my own issue but it it just I was introduced to, to it early but I still was like man this is just something that I like but I mean I know the research is there but it's just not it's not super easy for me to access and so that's where you know I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself here but that's being introduced to Hydro last year I mean, it was so easy. Um, my strength coaches are just like, here, try this. So I was like, perfect. I mean, this makes BFR so much easier. I can, you know, use it while I travel. I can use it at home. I mean, it was just part of my routine then. And it just was, I mean, I wish I had that in college because then I would have been so much further ahead of my recovery than where I was. Yeah, and we we are uh, kind of, you know, chomping at the bit to put product that we have, new product kind of like into rotation to try and get that feedback and learning both from like a product and, and a BFR point of view. I think um, one of the things that we get really excited about is having athletes that we work with like you who, who looks at the science, who really yeah. road tests product and science of BFR. Um, how are you, would you say you are typical of an athlete that you look into the science and, and the application of this or, or, or typically are athletes like, just give me the menu. I'll do the reps, the exercise. I don't need to know why. Like, what's the athlete mindset around this type of thing? That's a great question. I think I tend to be a little more, and not to be arrogant when I say this, I do think I, I tend to be a little more analytical with this stuff, but I think that also varies on around sport and personality. So I don't want to speak for like the whole of athletics, but in my experience in the NFL, I think people just want to do what makes them feel good, you know, and, and they're guided often by the athletic trainers or you know, some PTs that do things on them and then they start to know their body and what helps them. So everyone's different. But I do think I tend to look into the science a little bit more just because I have that like natural skepticism. Yeah. You mentioned earlier as well how busy the schedule is for you guys. Um, and especially if you're one of the teams that get picked to like come and do NFL international games, the travel is mad. So yep. how, how do you guys keep that recovery um, going when you're doing, like, you know, domestic flights you know sleep patterns get moved you're not in your own bed you don't have your own creature comforts what what goes in there to keep you guys fresh i mean that's I, i'd be interested to see now that i'm on the bills what they do but you know previous teams we didn't do a whole lot i mean a lot of it's on yourself and just trying to you know sleep and hydrate i, I wouldn't say there's any like structured plan it's kind of left up to the individual but last year i think the strength coaches and i did a really good job of um the strength coach uh, Ryan Vermillion, who introduced me to um, the Hytro shorts, had a great plan when we traveled cross country 
uh, cause we traveled like three times cross country, you know, we did a right after the flight, did a hydro bike session and then like did that twice, right? Like the day we got there and then the, the next day, cause we'd get out there early. So that was probably the most structure I had, but beyond that, like, I think it's kind of left up to the individual. Yeah. When you are doing things like BFR, do you get any, um, odd looks from teammates? Like what are you doing? Strapping your leg in? Is that safe type thing? You know, I, I've, um, mostly been using that, my hydro stuff here. So I think I'll get some looks probably when I bring it into, to the bills. I definitely did, um, at first in, uh, the commander's facility, but then everyone was just using it in the weight room. So like everyone kind of knew what the deal was. So it wasn't weird. And we had like some just probably 15 dedicated guys to it. So, so no one really questioned it, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could get some weird looks, but I think most of it's met with curiosity. And I think that's actually like good for, you know, high stroke just because people are interested and they see, you know, someone using a recovery modality, they want to know more about it. I mean, I would do the same thing if someone had some crazy thing on their head, like uh, not that hydro looks like that, but I would ask and be, be curious about it. Cause I think in the NFL, you have access to like the forefront of, these types of like human optimization technologies. I think that's, that is so key. So you, as a sport, I think uh, the NFL will continue to be like a test bed for brands yep. and, and science because yeah. you know, you've got superhero levels of athleticism. So the response you can extrapolate out further. Um, I, I would ask is, is there, um, is there anything else that you're seeing that you think is interesting in, in performance or recovery from, from a tech or, or an innovation point of view that you think could be becoming more apparent that we're going to see next at a consumer level in the game or is, is everything just like existing science in different versions? Yeah. I mean, that's great. I guess I would ask like what specifically you're referring to in terms of, you know, the avenues. I mean, I think there's stuff in, in medicine with, stem cells that's really interesting uh, i mean i think per, i've done these you know personalized blood tests that i started through the commanders that i feel like were very very insightful and kind of like that preventative medicine that i know like you know um maybe it's called if it's called medicine 2.0 or 3.0 whatever peter peter atia kind of refers to that stuff's really interesting um yeah anything again anything with sleep i'm always fascinated in um I, I know there's a lot of of wearables. I think those are can be interesting if they're a little more accurate. Um, yeah, I, I think there's just so much in the space, but anything that's like having some sex success, you know, with trials or scientifically is, is always interesting to me. But kind of like you said, being on the forefront is is an exciting place to be. So you get access to a lot. It helps you kind of um analyze and, and understand what's you know maybe snake oil or not and that's that's been a, been an exciting place for me to be and i think and how we see externally anyway the bills are uh, you know whilst they're a, a legacy franchise are yep. very much on the on the front foot for performance and innovation and coaching um how would you describe and i know you know you're going to have to be careful how you say this because it's your team but like how do you describe the culture around the bills and um how do they build that performance lifestyle what's this what's the style of of training there like how do they yeah. get guys brought in how have you got each other's back what's been different here to other okay. places you've made well it's a top tier organization i mean i've loved being a part of it um i think they hire a lot of people you know on, the, on their training staff and their their medical staff that just have have great backgrounds unique perspectives and are committed to you know trying to surround us with the best technology the best resources so so it's been excellent i mean there's they're really committed to to science and you know the pursuit of of performance and i've loved being around that and just the conversations that i've been able to have with a lot of the people here pick their brains has been so informative for me and so so valuable yeah and so are there any uh like characters that you think we should be keeping an eye on in bill's camp this year from either like an on-field performance or just just good guys to watch for the year you know honestly it's always fun to, to watch josh allen because he's just <laughs> one of the best ever so that's that's really fun um you know i so many of my teammates are funny but and and there's definitely some characters but what i will say is just like the type of person that's you know on the team is just such a high quality individual you know i've everyone here has been so great to me since i've joined and i just have loved being a part of it so so honestly i think you can really root for anybody because there's just so many good people here and i i really appreciate that slight diversion what do you make of uh 
the NFL like pathway program where we've seen sure. a couple of really high profile rugby athletes, for example, who are in that sport on our side of the yep. pond considered almost like freaks in their athleticism coming over and learning, you know, a whole new language, let alone a whole new game, really. Like, what do you make of that? And what advice would you give those type of players? I mean, I've had just such great experiences with all those dudes. They're just the, the most humble, um, just nicest guys. They pick up football really fast. I mean, some of them have turned into pro bowlers, right? Like Jordan Alada on the Eagles. Like I played with him a little bit and he was, he was from Australia, but just excellent, excellent player. I mean, I played with the, um, a uh, player from the UK last year, F.A. Obata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah great guy. He's, he does just great work and a great player. I mean, I've, I really uh, just been impressed by how, how the program's operated and the type of people they bring in, the character of the guys, how hard they work. So I love that program. I mean, I think um, it's obviously going to be adjustment for any of those people that come in, but it's such a, it's such a unique opportunity. So I would just say for them just to continue to make the most of it. And I've, I've never felt like any of those people haven't, or like there's ever been any attitude issues or, or they haven't worked hard. So I, I just want to see more and more of that. I think it's helping grow football and it's just giving us exposure to, to, you know, great, great people from around the world. Let's say uh, something changes and someone could go the other way. Would you ever look at like soccer or rugby for yourself? Is that, does that, any I, I would not be qualified, but I would <laughs> love to go live in Europe. So <laughs> I'd love to just do that. But <laughs> I did. Yeah. It'd be really interesting. I would, I don't know. I don't know what that would look like, but I, I would be very interested. What type of sport do you think you're built for? I mean, I, I would have to probably, I, I don't want to offend anyone in rugby. I'd probably have to say rugby just because that's the closest. I mean, again, never played it, have a general understanding, lots of respect. They're probably way more conditioned than, than I am in certain aspects, but I would have to say that. I mean, I can't say like soccer, that, that'd be ridiculous, right? I have to be like somewhat realistic. I don't know. We have one eye across the pond and we assume everyone over there is an athlete. So that's fine. I think you'd, you'd fit in. Okay. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know you're really busy. It's been, it's been really insightful to hear uh, a lot about preseason how you're building your recovery and, and your insight on, on Hytro and BFR. I have one question that I, I love to ask people um, and, and it's always different when we get it back, but um, if you look at, you know, your time and the other athletes you've seen around you, you've got a pretty good perspective now on what makes success. So I, yeah. I love to hear from you. What makes the difference between a good and a great athlete? You know, and you have to be careful with this, but something I heard from a um, former Stanford athlete and also a former Commanders and Bills player. So I feel like I've, <laughs> I've been trying to, you know, follow his his uh, his path. But his name was Trent Murphy. He said, you know, effort is the price of admission and uh, obsession is the price of greatness. I think I said that correctly. But the general idea being to be great, you have to be obsessed. And I think that's, that's how I view it. I mean, I think the best people I've ever been around, and even for myself trying to be the best I can, I know it's a combination of, you know, skill, right? Talent matters. Like that's, that's of course, right? If you're completely untalented, you're not going to be great. It's, it's tough, but it's, it's that combination of work ethic. And again, that intentional hard work with your talent. So mm -hmm. for me, it's just being, obsessed with you know every way I can improve in football and and just turning myself into the best um, NFL player I can and I think that's where greatness lies it's in those obsession moments those obsessive athletes that just absolutely want to be the best and will do whatever it takes I love that I think culturally that speaks to hopefully what we're trying to build as a brand and we hear it from you loads as well it's yep. um, it, it does go back to the very first thing you said around that intentional hard work. You know, yep. yeah, talent opens the door, but then when you have, you know, a roster of 50 talented guys, how are you going to stand out? Off the totally. Back? Totally. And that's just life, right? That's how you, yeah. how you build a startup too. It's what's going to make you stand out. And I think a lot of it is just that attitude and desire to, to really know yourself and know how you need to improve. I think attitude can take you so far. And we, we, when I speak to other athletes that, do, you know, be it tennis, be it football, be it rugby, that are using yeah. it, one of the things that are coming through loud and clear for the guys that are most successful 
and the, go, and the guys who, where we're seeing the biggest impact is the use of BFR is less about, um, if I add BFR, I can reduce the amount of time I'm training and get the same effect. It's more about if I add BFR to my training recovery, I get more from it, right? So it's not a shortcut because- Oh, totally. Hard work beats talent and talent work hard, right? So like, do you feel the same? That's kind of the way you see it? Yeah. I'm saving, but- Yeah, I think if you're looking at BFR as a shortcut, then you're you're not the type of person that can benefit the most from it, if that makes sense, right? But also I, I'd like to think like those people- aren't even like the main clientele of BFR, right? Like it's not a shortcut. And maybe some people want to see it at that. Uh, and, and if you're not playing sport, that's fine. Or if you're hurt, like it's a different thing. But I think it really is like the the exponential um, impact you can have from using it, right? How it, how it makes you just more effective or you can just become, you know, a stronger, more conditioned athlete through using it. And also- the recovery aspect of it that can help you go again faster harder and and play better and and those are the elements of bfr that stand out to me not like the idea that oh i could do less work it's like no the same amount of work or more and it becomes more effective exactly that so we're um we're continually trying to find the best way to help people understand bfr and then apply it through product innovation and we're yeah. we're, we're we're hearing this like repeated phrase i guess the more we're doing around BFR makes it easier for athletes to work harder. I don't know how that sits with you. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I had not thought about that, but yeah, it, it does. It just makes the task, you know, harder, more effective, arguably, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that definitely makes sense because it forces you to work harder and it forces your body to work harder. So, So that definitely makes sense to me, but also... I think obviously you should be just working hard anyway and and BFR supplements that. And I think there's are moments where, you know, if you're being intentional about your program, right? Like adding in some BFR with, you know, lower weights or during your downtime or, or whatever it is also makes sense because you can get that same stimulus, but also, you know, less of, you know, the impact on your joints or on your on your programming type of thing. So going into this uh, new campaign, like who is the team or the player that you're most looking forward to, you know, setting up against? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm looking forward to all the games, uh, but it, we do play the Chiefs and I've only played the Chiefs once in my career. Obviously, they're perennial um, I'm powerhouse. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to gearing up against them. Yeah, you get a lot of highlight reels if you play the Chiefs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then second one is, again, growing, growing fandom over here for the Bills. Uh, is it tough to know that because you're playing with the Bills, you, you know won't get to tailgate with the Bills, which, as we understand, it is a you know experience in its own right, anyway. Yeah, I've only I've only heard the legends of of Bills Mafia and and all the tailgate uh, um, experiences. So yeah, I mean that's that's definitely sad. I've never really been able to tailgate because uh, I wasn't able to in college, and I've been playing pro football. So so maybe one day I'll be able to do that and and get the full experience. Brilliant. Well, uh, Casey, thank you so much. Again, I appreciate your time. I know you're really busy. This has been a um, you know, really insightful conversation. Um, for all listeners, make sure you subscribe to make sure you don't miss any other great uh, episodes like this. And we'll hear you next time.